This is an SR latch, a very rudimentary form of flash memory. And this is an embryo growing up into becoming a fly. And by the end of this video, I am going to show you the core mathematical idea that ties these two very different ideas together, and how all of that leads to growing a fly's eye out of its butt. So let's get started. So I'll tell you right off the bat, I am not going to give you the answer right away. No, 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 this won't be as entertaining for the both of us. I want to play a little game, a little scavenger hunt, if you will. I'm going to explain to you the programming behind how a fly goes from an embryo to an adult, and while you're watching that, try to figure out what this mathematical concept is. And if you figure it out before I pull back the curtains, be sure to comment what you thought it was and the timestamp you figured it out. Here's a little extra bit to seal the deal here. What we're learning today isn't exclusive to flies, but it is actually the essence of how humans and most animals grow. So without further ado, let's unveil the biology to reveal the math. Okay, so zoom out a little. What we're going to be learning is going to have a lot of specific names being thrown around, and that may confuse some of you. Even though I've simplified this quite a lot, there are at least 10 different names for different little parts. What I want you to take away from all of this though isn't the little details of all the pieces, but the major themes behind how all of those pieces interact together. And well, take a moment to let this sink in. Somehow, an embryo that's neat and symmetrical can somehow know to develop into something as complex as a fly. How does it know where to put the wings? It could have easily put two of them in a row. How does it space out the segments neatly and evenly? And even more fundamentally, is that first of all, how does it know its head from its tail? And part of the answer to this is gradients. Yes, it's the same gradients you get when you're mixing colors. Place a dye at the center of some water, and it diffuses, fades out, forming a gradient. And this is the ingenious evolved design of a fly. It's that these gradients work in combination to define where each of the body parts go. In order to make the first layers of gradients, what the fly's mother does is that it fixes the mRNAs for different things in different locations inside of the embryo. This is where the gradient starts. If you call the central dogma, mRNA gets translated into proteins, the workhorse of the cells. In this case, they work as signals. The amazing thing about this is that the mRNA sticks in place Yes, but the proteins are free to diffuse about. The mother places these mRNA in very specific locations. Some are at the poles and some are allowed to float everywhere. So why are these gradients important? Let's take a look at one of the polar ones called bicoid. Bicoid acts as a signal that inhibits the translation of caudal, which means that over time, Caudal's concentration lowers near where Bitcoin is present. The same applies to the other pair, Nanos and Hunchback. One thing that breaks this symmetry, though, is that Bitcoin also activates Hunchback, which also feedback loops and activates itself, pushing Hunchback into a new stable state. In effect, what this causes is a very clear distinction between the front, formerly the anterior, of the insect, marked by hunchback and bicoid, and the tail, the posterior, by nanos and caudal. Not only that, but these will activate the next layers of signals, adding more and more complexity down the line. Since these pieces of code came from the mother, they are called maternal effect genes. How did we biologists know the function of these genes? Well, fruit flies are essentially a tier below than a lab rat. So what they did was that they played a little messed up logic puzzle. They deleted the code for Bitcoin, and what happened was that the maggots did not develop a head. Instead, it developed a tail for where the head was supposed to be. And that's how they knew what Bitcoin did. See? Biology is just one messed up logic puzzle. Now, the next layer defines the groundworks for the segments of the insect and the main three regions of the insect. All insects have three body regions, the head, the thorax, chest, and abdomen, um, tummy, essentially. And all the body parts are formed in segments. 
The layer of code that starts defining these parts are called gap genes. This is because if they aren't present, a whole section of the body gets deleted, causing gaps in the body. And these genes interact logically amongst themselves and the maternal effect genes from earlier to form even more complex gradients, which themselves are like the input map for the next layer down the line. For instance, the giant gene gets activated by caudal, one of the posterior genes, and bicoid in the anterior, making it present in both the head and the abdomen. Giant is also in this antagonistic relationship with another gene called cripple, German for cripple. If there is a lot of giant, it represses cripple, never giving a chance to rise back up, making the giant level stable and unchallenged. However, the opposite is also true. A lot of cripple gets rid of giant, so that defines where the thorax is going to be. Well, kind of. Cripple also stretches a little bit back to the abdomen, but the other genes down the line make this boundary much clearer. We're not going to go into dive deep into this detail, though. The curious thing is that even if we stop sending signals for both of them to activate, they will remain in either two possible states, each of them being stable states, but never coexisting, based solely upon the initial pattern set by the layer above. One other cool motif I'd like to look at here is that Hunchback also activates and deactivates Cripple based on the dosage. If there's too much or too little of that, Cripple won't activate defining the middle of the body even further. Now, we've defined the body regions more roughly. It's time to go down the next layer to making the segments. Imagine this. We're transitioning from a very dynamic and very continuous pattern of gradients to a very discrete pattern of segments. This is pretty much an analog to digital converter for biology. It's really amazing how this works. Let's zoom out a little. If we simplify our gradients, you can see these overlapping patterns, right? That's kind of where the segments go. The genes that control where the segments go are able to recognize these inputs and logically compute where the segments go. Say, if there's hunchback but no cripple and giant at the same location, then make Eve stripe 2, and so on and so forth. And you just gotta appreciate the controls here. Each stripe is controlled only using one gene and a bunch of control points, it's basically a huge tower of an if-else code for biology. These genes are known as pair rule genes. They're named that way since deleting them corresponds to deleting a, one of the pairs of segments. The segments aren't finished in this one step, though. The pair rule genes activates a deeper layer of genes called segment polarity genes. These shift the segments from earlier and establish the anterior and the posterior within each segment. Essentially the polarity of each segment, and that's where it got its name from. So these new segments are the real segments, and the ones from before are called parasegments. Now, now, here's the part where it gets interesting. All of these genes work together to activate another layer that controls the individual identity of the segments, where the wings go, where the legs go, where the antennae go. And the layer that controls this is called the homeotic selector genes. The fun part here isn't really how this works, but how we can start doing some pretty cool Frankensteinish stuff with it. The essence of this is just to delete a piece of code and see how the living thing's programming will run. Let's just say we delete the gene UBX, ultra bithorax. What happens is that, oh no, the last thorax segment now only sees the antennapedia and P gene, so it swaps out the gyroscope on the back defined by the UBX gene for another set of wings. Also, it kills the fly, but let's not be distracted from the fact that the fly now has four wings. Anyway, that's not the end of the story. These homeotic genes, also known as Hox genes, also exist in other organisms, not just within insects, but also in lobsters, fish, mice, and yes, humans. You just have to originate from a bilaterally symmetric ancestor. 
these Hox genes are like master switches to an organism's body part identification. They are basically, well, telling the body, ooh, leg goes here, fingers go here, wings go here, so on and so forth. Hox genes are a part of a larger group called homeobox genes, and these are also highly conserved. For example, the signal that allows us to make eyes, PAC6, also exists in fruit flies. So you can take a liquid sample from a human eye cell and inject it into a fly's bum and it will trick the machinery of the fly into thinking it should grow eyes here at that location. Even though the switches are the same, what they activate can be different. That's why instead of growing a human eye, the fly grew a fly's eye instead. This makes evolution such an easy and modular task. Modifying what Hox genes activate instead of just making a new type of body part every single time it evolves. And this, my friends, is the amazing field of Evo Devo. So, after watching all of that, have you uncovered the mathematical pattern? If your answer is by stability, then you're right on the money. By stability from differential equations, that is. For those of you who don't know, Biostability is when there are two stable states that a certain system can tend towards, and the selection for one of those states depends on the initial conditions of the system. For example, in the giant crippled case, if you had one more than the other, then the system just shifts towards favoring that. The deeper implication here is that much like our silicon brethren, biostability is what leads to long-term memory. Let's just say we start at 0, 0, right? You can see that if I apply a signal to move the systems towards the top state, when I remove the signal, the system doesn't travel back to 0, 0 like we begin with. It travels towards the nearest stable state, in effect, remembering that there was a bias applied to it initially. So that's cool and all, but for those of us who want to program the damn things, how do we code by stability into living cells? And this is the reason why I chose to tell this story through a fly's lenses. It's because it contains all the motifs you need for long-term memory in most organisms. The first one is positive autoregulation. It's a simple positive feedback loop. It's almost the same as negative autoregulation from the second episode, except for the fact that it's self-activating instead of self-repressing. And similar to NAR, it might not be immediately obvious why this motif has a use, where the NAR makes the production process faster by increasing the gap between protein creation rate and degradation rate significantly. The wider this gap, the faster the rate of net protein creation is. And the state of the system it tends towards is where the two rates cross, essentially when the net rate is zero. This is where the system kind of stops and lingers in an equilibrium. This is what we call a fixed point. The positive autoregulation thingy does the opposite thing. It makes the rate of production actually even slower. But that's not the only thing it did, because now it crosses at three points instead of just one. This may not seem like anything at first glance, but now we have three places where the system can stay fixed in place. And by looking at the difference of rates, you can see that the creation rate is higher here. So the amount of protein increases. But at these two other locations, the destruction rate is higher, so it decreases. So as you can see, the system tends away from the middle point that goes towards the two other points instead. And even if you disturb this equilibrium, it will just most likely slide back into the stable state. It's like a well that sucks everything into it. By initially putting your system above or below a certain threshold, you are able to literally determine the long-term fate of it. The same idea works for toggle switches as well, except our plot now doesn't include the rates but the two sides of the switch on each axis. I will go into detail onto these types of plots in the next episode, but for now you can see that the system evolves like this. And you can see that it made three fixed points. And in this case, being above or below a certain threshold will also lead to either state. In addition, you can also feed the output of this system into another, just like how Giant and Cripple inputs into Eve Stripe 2, such that it only expresses in a certain area where both of the other genes are not present. 
So there you have it. That is the mathematics behind how memory in living systems, well, and also how we can modify living things, works. Something cool you might also want to check out is that toggle switch technique is used by Jim Collins and his collaborators to make the first artificial bio toggle switch. And this paper back in 2000 jump started the whole field of synthetic biology, modifying living systems to produce whatever biomaterials we want. If that isn't amazing, I don't know what is. Next episode, we'll be delving into oscillations in biology, the cycle that controls how our cells copy and paste themselves, our sleep cycle, and so much more. But for now, please like and subscribe, and thank you for watching. Goodbye.